Good morning, friends. Whether here together in the sanctuary or gathered across the ether through the gift of YouTube, we are glad and grateful to gather as God's people together. Our call to worship reminds us that we gather in the presence of our God who is with us always and draws even closer when we are in need. As you are comfortable, I invite you to stand and to join responsively in the words that are printed in our bulletins or appearing on the screen before you at home. We gather in the steadfast love of the Lord. God draws near and delivers us from deep waters. And we continue to put our trust in God now, lifting our voices in gratitude and praise with the singing of Christ is Alive. Again, the words are in your bulletin or on the screen. Let us sing with joy. You may be seated. God knows the circumstances of our lives, our regrets, and our hopes. Our openness to God increases God's ability to work through us for our good and for the good of the world. We join now in the prayer of confession and renewal, followed by a time of silent prayer. God, who invites us us to the waters waters of of grace, Help Help us us to to comprehend comprehend the magnitude of your your mercy. mercy. You draw draw us us into fullness of life. You You liberate us from what has bound us. us. You welcome welcome us us into joyful freedom, freedom, given given so that that we may may generously serve others. others. Your Your gift gift is a gift. Guide us into full acceptance of your forgiving love. Amen. Amen. Christ is our peace, breaking down all barriers to a whole and wondrous life. We can be glad for the path before us. Amen.
Let us welcome one another in the peace of Christ. It is a joy to be together here at home in Palos Verdes on a, what once was a sunny morning and now is back to gray, or at home wherever you are and whatever the weather may be, God gathers with us despite all of those things, and we are glad and grateful. Those worshiping together for the first time, as we can be helpful to you. We look forward to doing so. We're glad to share in this time of worship and praise. And if you would be so kind as to share with us your names in the welcome pads that are on the back of the pew there and pass those along to neighbors and friends, that would be fun. And if you're at home and would like to let us know that you're here, we would be honored to be in touch with you as well. You can email April or me, april at rhumc.org, jonathan at rhumc.org, we are glad to be in conversation with you anytime. Our liturgist this morning is Chris Hall, who uh, joined our church family just before COVID hit, though we don't hold him responsible for that. Um, he and his wife, uh, Barbara, have lived in Palos Verdes for many years. In fact, Chris grew up here, uh, and they raised their family here as well. He works in the petroleum industry and is one of the most regular participants in April's Bible study classes. And so I know that she and others are glad for his presence there. And we are glad for yours here among us this morning. Uh, the flowers here in the sanctuary have been given by Andy and Lindy Miller in memory of their uh, beloved daughter, Erin. You can have your blood pressure checked after worship. Uh, Susan Marquis will be in the church office and glad to be helpful with that and any other health-related questions that you may have. And um, because it's a blood pressure Sunday, it's also, uh, if things turn out well, a donut Sunday. So again, time your donut and your blood pressure check as you see best. And then I want to share the, the happy news that I shared last week incorrectly. Um, luckily, it was corrected by those who were present. Um, but this evening at 7 p.m., uh, Cameron, or Kami Akioka, uh, the gifted pianist who has been a part of our church family through much of her young life, um, will be uh, joining the Peninsula Symphony for a performance of Beethoven's Piano Concerto No. 4, along with other works at Redondo Union High School, tonight at 7. Doors open at 6.45. If you enjoy Beethoven, if you enjoy hearing beautiful music, beautifully prepared and presented, you should be there. Uh, Cami um, has played for us here uh, in worship any number of times over the years. Uh, she did her undergraduate study in piano at Rice University and is currently enrolled at the Thornton School of Music at University of Southern California. So we are honored to count her among us and hope that some of you might have fun enjoying her this evening. And now I'd like to invite the children to gather here at the front. And we're coming to a slightly different location than usual up here at the front, but directed over here where we can take a look at the picture that came into the sanctuary today. Perfect. This picture of a river was made by John August Swanson, an artist and a good friend to our congregation. And I want us together to take a look at this picture and you can even scooch a little closer if you need to because I, I would like you to tell me what you see happening in the picture. So we can start up here near the top. What do you see happening? Mowing. Yeah, it, it's like mowing is one way to say it. Hoeing would be another word. The it, storm wiped it 
Yeah, it's a farm, and it, it looks and like the, the sun is shining, the river's coming along, the farmers are irrigating, there's a garden over here. Yes, the sheep are drinking from the water and enjoying and they, the green and, pasture. And they are swimming in the ocean. They're swimming in that river. They're having fun. Does anybody notice a few others? This is very thorough. That's a shepherd and some more sheep. And these people, yes, Willa? Um, Let's give Willa a turn to see if she sees something too, okay? Willa, what did you notice? Did you see these people um, washing their clothes in the river? Or these people filling jugs of water from the river? Clark, what did you want to add? Baptizing. Excellent. Yes. And this is Jesus' baptism. And we know this. Here's someone. He's kneeling in the water. And here's John the Baptist uh, helping him go down and up from the water. And the reason we know it's Jesus is because of this light and this dove. The story in the Bible says the heavens opened and the Spirit of God came down like a dove. And so we know that this is Jesus' baptism. And it's a beautiful picture helping us to remember how much, how important it is, baptism for every single follower of Jesus. Yeah, so... Water yep, at the beach is a good place to play with water too. Some of us are baptized in a whole lot of water, like Jesus was. He had the whole river. Some of us get a scoop of water on our heads because we're here in church and we get it out of the baptismal font. But for all of us, the meaning of baptism is the same. It means that God loves us with more love than we can possibly imagine. And that through Jesus, God makes it possible for us to walk in newness of life. Newness of life means that we serve God and serve the world with joy and peace and energy and hope and devotion. So baptism involves water, but it's not exactly the same as taking a bath. We have to take a lot of baths in our life. Pretty much every day, I bet you take a bath or a shower, right? Because we get sweaty or sticky or grimy. We've been busy. We spilled food on ourselves. We got the pain in our elbows, right? And so... Every day we need a bath and it always feels wonderful. We have one baptism in our whole lives and because of the gift of the Holy Spirit that comes with it, it's always working in us and through us. Our baptism keeps helping us our whole lives long to grow in grace and faith and love. Now a long time ago, all this about baptism was explained by a man named Paul. Hundreds of years ago, he wrote a letter. And in those days, he, people wrote their letters on parchment, which wasn't quite as rectangular and smooth as this paper is. But he wrote his letter to people in Rome, and when they got the letter, they read it, and they found it so helpful, they gave it to their friend to read, and their friend gave it to their next friend to read, and their friend gave it to their sister, and gave it back to the other friend, and they circulated that letter around and around until people practically had it memorized. And then they started making copies of it and sending it to other cities because it was such an encouraging letter. And eventually it made its way into the Bible so that we could be encouraged by it too. I see Clark's been working on reading it. Would you like to read it or shall I read it? It's one of my favorite. Okay. Dean Child, thank God. All of us have been baptized in Christ Jesus so that, like him, we too may walk in newness of life from your friend Paul, a senant of God. To God, he the glory. Amen. You did a fantastic job, and I'm going to read it one more time. Yes, beautiful. I'm going to read it one more time just because of the microphone, and we want the people at home to be able to hear it too. And you are exactly right. It says, Dear child of God, all of us have been baptized in Christ Jesus so that we, like him, may walk in newness of life. From your friend Paul, a servant of God, to God be the glory. Amen. And that's a good prayer right there. I'm just going to add, Dear God, thank you for loving us and teaching us and guiding us so that we may live in faith according to your purposes. Amen. I hope you have a good time in Sunday school. And Keep practicing your reading. That was fantastic. <laughs>
and your observation skills really great too. As we prepare to share together in a time of prayer, it is a gift and a joy uh, to see Donna Gallagher with us this morning as she continues her recovery from surgery and regains mobility. Um, we've had her in our 
prayers for some weeks now, and it is uh, just uh, lifts my heart to see you in, in, in person. It is good to be together. We have other persons um, who, who are also giving thanks, and some who are facing challenges that are important to them. And we are very glad that um, baby uh, Florence Naragi is home from the hospital now and is uh, nursing well. So she is where she belongs uh, among her family and has come through the uh, intensive care that followed her uh, early uh, induction into this world. Um, Liesl Drosch is having hip surgery later this week, June 29th, and we'll want to keep her in our love and care. Uh, we are also giving thanks that uh, Carolyn Oberparleiter is able to uh, leave Colorado today uh, in the company of her son, uh, Brian Lampshire. He'll be flying back with her. Um, she had had a stroke while on the way to Denver and will be continuing her recovery at Little Company of Mary in San Pedro, which is not only a wonderful rehab center, but also very close to her home. So we're glad for all of that. Joan Davidson uh, had a fall while visiting in San Francisco and is recovering from hip surgery, which was undertaken there. Uh, Adrian Short fell at home uh, and has a broken bone near her foot that is uh, continuing to need attention and care. Um, Nina Bradbury has moved to uh, memory care at the Canterbury uh, after a, a fall that she had last week um, that revealed that she was um, uh, in need of further attention than she was able to have just on, on her own. And then um, uh, Gertha Benson's uh, niece, uh, her name is Heaven uh, Tresvan, um, lifted up her need for prayer in in the midst of a pregnancy that is happening while she has a number of other health conditions and is concerned for the health, the viability of this uh, pregnancy and um, for uh, the, uh, her own health in being able to carry uh, that baby to term. And so we gather our hearts, our minds, our spirits together with an awareness not only of these needs but others that are present among us today and whether, again, we are here in the sanctuary or over the days to come um, uh, as we gather uh, virtually, um, please know that God hears these and other prayers. And as I am lifting up these names, if you are lifting your own needs and hopes, uh, God is with us all together. Uh, let us now pray. God of mercy and majesty, God of hope and joy, we come to you this morning in prayer to thank you. We come to be reminded of your grace and care that goes with us in all our days. You know us better than we know ourselves. You number the hairs on our heads and watch over us in your steadfast love. You encourage us to live in the confidence and hope that you are with us wherever we go. You invite us to step out with faith and encourage, speaking the truth of your love as we follow where Christ leads. Around our world, O oh God, your people face challenges to their lives and hopes. In Ukraine and in Russia, Conflict over power, over land, over the very future threatens so many and undermines possibilities for lasting progress in our world. Migrants to Europe as well as to our own land risk their lives in the search for a more hopeful future for them and their families. We fail to take care of our human family, whether those in trouble live across the world or across the street. Encourage us, gracious God, with a vision of peace for your children everywhere. God of life and health, we lift up to you 
members and friends of this church family who are in need of your healing care, your compassion, your strength. We offer prayers for baby Florence, for Adrian Short, Liesl Drosch, Heaven Tresvan, Carolyn, Joan, Nina, Pamela and Stanley, Andy, Bill, Ron, Jake, Jean, Dave, Donovan, Charles, Beth, Christy, Andy, and others we name now in the silence of our hearts. Surround them with your comfort and care and hold them close in the arms of your love. Comfort as well the family of Charles Kittiver and let his memory be a blessing to them and to those who knew and loved him through the years to come. O oh God, you put before us the opportunity and the invitation to reach out to the world you love. In Jesus, you offer us new life and hope as we put an end to our old ways and allow your grace to raise us. Help us to live in generosity and compassion with those you have given us to serve. Hear our prayer this day as we join in the words Jesus taught his own disciples to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our gifts to the mission of the church are conveyed in person, online, and through the mail. Our offering plates are both physical and digital, and contributions arrive throughout the week. We dedicate them all with this prayer. Eternal God, in gratitude for your unending love, we offer you fruits of our labors and of your generosity. Use them as you will to the best advance the health of the world and the life-giving gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Please be seated. The Apostle Paul wrote to the people in Rome before he had ever met them. He wanted to confirm that the believers there had a full understanding of the grace of God and the nature of a faithful human response to that grace. In this portion of the letter, he celebrates the meaning, meaning of Christian baptism. Romans 6 begins on page 189 of the New Testament portion of the Sanctuary Bibles. We'll be reading the second part of verse 1 through verse 11. Shall we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we might too walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. We grandmothers like to share cute stories about our grandchildren. This one comes from a friend of mine who lives in another state. Her granddaughter, Madeline, was two years old or maybe approaching close to three when a baby brother was born. Of course, Madeline had noticed her mommy's growing tummy. Of course, her parents had talked to her about the baby in order to try to prepare her ahead of time. But Madeline had no previous reference point. She herself was the second of two girls, so she'd been welcomed by an older sister, but she had no idea of what that entailed and no personal experience of her family increasing in size. Once he had made his appearance, Madeline was allowed to hold the new baby. She was invited to help care for him by bringing his blanket or patting his back. Apparently for Madeline, these activities quickly got old. No doubt she noticed that the baby required a lot of her parents' attention. Possibly hearing him cry was not all that fun. A few days into the experience, she turned to her parents and demanded to know, why does the baby have to live here? <laughs> Concepts of family and sibling have more dimensions than we realize when we first learn the words. Madeline's question is funny because what is obvious to most of us was not obvious to her. She was going to have to discover from experience what it meant that the baby belongs to the family and the family belongs to the baby. The question which prompts Paul's reflections on the role of God's grace in our lives is like Madeline's question in that it reflects less than full understanding. Should we continue to sin so that grace may abound? To people with the relevant experience, the answer would be obvious. No, of course not. We do not seek out opportunities to do wrong and to distance ourselves from God in order to give God more occasion for showing generous forgiveness. However, as Paul realized, there may be some people 
who are so new to the awareness of being loved by God without having to earn God's love that they could benefit from help in understanding the concepts of grace and freedom and new life. Truthfully, it never hurts any of us to review what we think we know and to attempt some advances toward grasping and incorporating what we still need to learn. So let's start with grace. We United Methodists and our friends can learn a lot about grace from John Wesley. John and his brother Charles and a few of their friends started a spiritual growth group when they were students at Christ Church College in Oxford in the 1720s. Because of this group, the name Methodist came into being. Because of John the preacher and Charles the hymn writer, the Methodist Church gained a distinct identity, starting in England but coalescing in the United States in 1784 and eventually spreading all around the world. If you were to look in a United Methodist hymnal, you would find that the hymns about grace are organized into three categories. Prevenient grace, which is the love and mercy of God that goes ahead of us and works to draw us into relationship with God and Christ Jesus. That's one. Second is justifying grace which forgives all the ways that we have gone astray from God and assures us of God's love for us. And third, sanctifying grace, which helps us grow in our ability to love and serve God, serve God's people, and serve God's world. Prevenient, justifying, and sanctifying grace are concepts described by John Wesley to emphasize that we are all in a process of learning and being made able to live more fully in the goodness of God. Wesley's understanding of grace is highly consistent with Paul's letter to the Romans. In chapter 6, verses 1 through 11, which Chris has just read for us, Paul emphasizes that our situation is not static. When we are baptized, we sink into the waters and we leave behind our old selves and the things that weigh us down and cause harm. We rise out of the water rejoicing that God's Spirit is working in us and through us. We are now in a position to do what Wesley called going on to perfection. Not in the sense that we are superior to anyone else, but in the sense that our acts of faith and our trust in God is transforming us more and more into the person God calls us to be. John Wesley was strongly influenced not only by the Book of Romans, but also by Martin Luther on this point, and in particular by Luther's commentary on the letter to the Romans. Wesley was actually listening to a reading of Luther's thoughts about the letter on the night when he, Wesley, experienced a profound sense of reconciliation to God. Perhaps he was stirred by Luther's observation that faith is a work of God in us, which changes us and brings us to birth anew from God. Or by Luther's testimony that faith is a living, unshakable confidence in God's grace, and that through faith, a person will do good to everyone without coercion, willingly and happily. They will serve everyone, suffer everything for the love and praise of God, who has showed them such grace. Change, dying and rising, walking in newness of life, living to God, these are themes that have been highlighted by great leaders of the church across time and geography, inviting us to enter into and experience the process of spiritual growth and transformation. Inviting is a word deliberately used because in Paul's letter, 
we are being encouraged to freely choose to experience freedom in Christ. The problem with thinking that it would be a good idea to sin more so that grace can abound is that sin is not actually anything fun. Sin leads to self-harm and social harm. By encouraging us to die to sin, Paul does not mean to quash our exuberance in the good gifts of God's amazing creation. He's actually simply longing for us to experience liberation from addiction, violence, dishonesty, exploitation, cruelty, so that we can truly enjoy our lives in the world. For those who purport to be following Jesus to suggest, let's keep sinning, is about as far off the mark as when the followers of Moses, who by God's power had escaped bondage in Egypt, said, let's go back, the food was better there. Apparently, they forgot that captivity costs lives. After all the work and sacrifice extended to gain release, they forgot. Maybe we forget sometimes that the goal is to go forward into the freedom to be faithful to God, not back into fear and frustration. God, says Paul, wants us to be able to live in freedom. And freedom does not mean self-centeredness. It means living our lives in God and for God. In our case, it means Christ-centeredness. I read a remarkable story recently about a man, a gardener actually, with a landscape business, who is creatively working to solve a really annoying problem in the place where he lives which is the Yucatan Peninsula. The problem is sargassum, the invasive sewage-scented seaweed, which has been piling up on beaches across the Caribbean and in other parts of the world as well. Perhaps you have seen reports on how horrible it smells and what an overwhelming amount of it there is. It dwells in the Atlantic Ocean and seems to have gotten everywhere. The problem solver is Omar de Jesus Vasquez Sanchez, whose initial efforts, starting in 2015, centered around organizing a beach cleanup to help remove the leafy algae from the shore so that the water could return to its lovely blue color and the people trying to enjoy the sun and the sand would not feel so nauseated. The causes of the recurring superbloom of sargassum seem to be a combination of pollution, overdevelopment, and warmer temperatures. But Omar has not focused so much on the problem as the potential of receiving the seaweed as a useful gift. In 2018, he imagined a way to turn sargassum into building blocks by combining it with other materials. Today, these blocks are used to build affordable housing in his community. The product is called Sarga Block. Omar sees it as having a parallel trajectory to his own life. Omar grew up without a home and without a father. His parents, his mother and his grandparents migrated wherever they needed to go to find work. So there was no, no sense of permanence. And there was a time in his life when he fell into compulsive drug use and became its prisoner. Illness subsequently caused him to fall into homelessness. But Omar doesn't dwell so much anymore on the pain of the past. He has been freed from that prison of having no sense of control over his own life. He understands his freedom is an opportunity to turn curses into blessings, to live generously and honor the memory of his mother and his grandparents who worked so hard to keep him alive by working now himself for the good of people like them. Omar has built and donated 14 homes out of these Sarga blocks to families in need, including single moms, elderly couples, and parents supporting children with disabilities. 
When I look at Sargablock, says Omar, it's like looking in a mirror. When you have problems with drugs or alcohol, you are viewed as a problem for society. When sargassum started arriving, it created a similar reaction. Everyone was complaining. I wanted to mold something good out of something everyone saw as bad. This is what Paul means by the transforming power of God's grace. We are no longer enslaved to sin, he writes. Grace releases us from the shackles that limit and destroy life and brings us instead into the freedom to live for the joy and the satisfaction of doing what is kind and good. The story can be true for all of us. We too, Paul affirms, may walk in newness of life. The concept of being alive to God comes out of the image of Christ's dying and rising. Because Christ died and was raised, we know that sin and all its hurtful dynamics no longer have ultimate power over us. Sin is finished. Sin is over, we might say. But what is not over and will never be over is the life we can have with God and because of God and for God. Consider yourselves alive to God in Jesus Christ, urges Paul at the end of verse 11. In English, that word that is <clears throat> translated as alive comes out as an adjective. And I've learned from a biblical scholar that in the original Greek, it's a participle, which means that it's formed from a verb. Verbs, of course, denote action, and adjectives describe a state of things. And so we have this word that's uh, encompassing both verb and adjective, perhaps implying in its layers of meaning that we are alert and present to God, that we are animated and guided by God. We may, in fact, say that we are actively living or coming alive in the warmth of God's grace and freedom. Perhaps it happens for us the way it happens for a butterfly, emerging from its chrysalis, fluttering its wings in the sun, and learning to float on the breeze. We are drawn forward in grace and freedom by these possibilities of liveliness and life within God's embrace. Amen. We have a privilege and a joy this day to welcome uh, into our family and fellowship persons who have been uh, worshiping and participating in our life together now for some time. Uh, Art and Debbie, could I invite you forward and to join me here at the front? Um, they are among uh, a number of other good friends whose uh, biographies or brief biographies you can uh, find in your bulletin insert. We have folks who are uh, joining our church family uh, today at 8.30 and at 10 and at 5.30 at whatever services they find as home for themselves. And um, so you can learn about Art and Debbie there. Um, but um, I want to say it has been a joy for me to come to know them. Um, we first made contact in person at a time of uh, need, that they were uh, going through a time of challenge. And that led to our getting to celebrate a time of great joy, um, bringing their lives together uh, in marriage not very long ago. And um, I've had the fun of seeing them here and had the surprise of seeing them uh, unexpectedly in hospital when I was visiting someone else. And, and Debbie heard my voice at the nursing station and came to get me so that I could have a visit with, with them there. And, 
Um, just to see them here on a regular Sunday, um, I just can't tell you, it just uh, makes me uh, glad all, all the way down. And so um, after the service, uh, you'll be invited to welcome them, greet them uh, in person. They'll be out on the patio. You'll have to choose between blood pressure donuts and these fine persons. Um, but I know that we can attend to all of those. And, and so, um, Art and Debbie, I would invite you to join with me in the questions that we have and uh, to affirm your faith and your presence here today. The church is a family of people with varieties of gifts united by God's love shown to us in Jesus Christ. The church is a community which seeks to share those gifts with each other and the world, offering healing and hope to persons in need. As a church, we gather to worship God to celebrate our common joys, to deepen our faith, and to share with each other concern and support, love and service. I ask, therefore, do you affirm your faith in Jesus Christ, God's gift of love for the whole world? Do you wish to join the congregation of Rolling Hills United Methodist Church and to share in its life and work? I do. Will you seek to give of yourself and to grow in faith, hope, and love as members of this community of faith. I will. I will. Members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. Now I'd invite you to join with us together in the words that help remind us of who we are as a family of faith together. With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround you with a community of love and forgiveness that you may grow in God and be found faithful in your service to others. We will pray for you that you may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. All right, welcome. So, so glad to be with you. God bless you both. Yeah. And as they return to their seats, we might find the words of our hymn of celebration, the Spirit, this is the Spirit's entry now, and let us sing with joy and hope in our hearts. It is our joy and privilege to go forth now confident of the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, the healing and hope of the Holy Spirit. We go in peace. Mm -hmm. 